Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this Sunday morning services. It's a blessing to have you with us. And uh, we'll be continuing our message in, re in regards to psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, last Sunday, we covered psalms, and all of our music was in regards to that. And every single song we heard last week was actually out of the book of Psalms. And uh, this week, we'll be covering what are hymns. And uh, we see mentioned in the Word of God, the word hymns only mentioned four times throughout Scripture. And Paul the Apostle, he uh, says two of those times he mentions hymns. And uh, one of the locations it mentions in Matthew and in Mark, and it's in the same uh, situation there, uh, same story, uh, just repeating each other, and it mentions about hymns there as well. So let's see, uh, begin in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, which that's what we covered last week, and we mentioned uh, that 73 of those psalms were written by David, one by Moses, two by Solomon, and uh, different folks wrote there. And also psalms are prophetical as well. Uh, we covered that last week. And uh, so we see here the next thing that's mentioned that Paul the Apostle, as he addresses the church, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking, singing, and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that you give us clarity on what you'd have us to hear. And Father, in all things, we give you the honor and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to cover this week on hymns. So what is a hymn? And, uh, well, we see it goes back to the days of Jesus. And uh, as we see here, if you would go back to with, with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 26. And Matthew chapter 26. We see in Matthew chapter 26 and then verse 30. Matthew 26 and then verse 30. This is at the conclusion at the uh, Lord's Supper. He knew that his time was... Uh, about to happen where he's about to be tried and uh, hung up on the cross and shed his blood for us on our behalf. Uh, but before that, he had uh, he had the Lord's Supper uh, where he offered his body, he offered his blood, and they took part of that. And it says at the conclusion of that in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 26, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So we see in the Word of God, the word him actually mentioned uh, in four references. Again, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. And then Paul restates to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And then we see in Matthew chapter 26, at the conclusion of uh, the Lord's Supper, they went out and sung a hymn. And then Mark chapter 14, that mentions the same reference as well. And uh, so what is a hymn? Well, when you think about what is a hymn, did we actually sing the hymns that Jesus did? No, we have no idea. Uh, if we're going to be biblically honest, we have no idea what hymn that Jesus sung or what hymns they sung back during those days. Uh, when it references uh, music, we see that Moses, they had a song of Moses uh, as he liberated those people out of the uh, wilderness, the children of Israel. And they had a song of Moses. And uh, we know that Paul the Apostle, when he prayed, and uh, they sang praises to the Lord, they sang praises in prison. But when it comes to the actual word hymn, what is a hymn? Uh, well, as we stated, we see first it's mentioned here in the New Testament, the word hymn. And uh, nowadays we sing, we say, hey, we're going to sing songs out of our hymn book. And those hymns were created, and we'll see this in a little bit. Uh, where do our hymns come from? Who wrote our hymns? Um, and uh, we first see that uh, when you go to a particular country, uh, the way they sing songs are a little bit different than the way we sing songs. Uh, for example, if you have a Christian church that's in Iran, uh, the hymns that they sing are not going to be exactly the hymns that we sing. So the hymns that we sing in our country and we're in the European uh, location are generally those who were created in Europe uh, during the uh, late 1700s to early 1900s. 
and uh, we'll be covering a few of those. And it's going to be interesting, very interesting to see the different authors who actually wrote hymns. Uh, one of the things that we need to realize that uh, when people put together a hymn, uh, it's not necessary that they have the music to go along with it. So when you get see a hymn book, and we'll open up one of those in a little bit, uh, at the very one side will have the person who actually wrote the hymn. On the other side will actually have the person who put together the music. And there are times, like Philip Don and uh, uh, Fanny Crosby, they'd put together a hymn together. But quite often, uh, the music would come later on. So in churches, quite often, sometimes they'd sing a cappella uh, because they didn't have the music to these songs oftentimes. And uh, there was a transition from that, from them singing. Uh, we have songs that go back to the uh, 500, 500 years after Christ. And uh, we'll cover a few of those hymns. But uh, I... Pray that you enjoy the next couple of hymns that are coming up, and uh, we'll listen to a few of those again with our message this morning. Uh, it'll be strictly just hymns that uh, have gone through the ages, and uh, we'll look at that. And then also our next uh, thing we're going to be looking at is who actually wrote hymns, the what churches they're from, the authors, uh, and some of the stories behind those hymns. So I hope you enjoy the next couple of hymns that are coming up. Philip Bliss was born into very humble beginnings. He was born July 9, 1838, in a log cabin in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, to parents who taught him to love the Lord and to love music. Philip Bliss was uneducated for the first 10 years of his life. He grew up with a Bible as his only textbook and his mother as his only teacher. From a very young age, Philip was drawn to Jesus and music. His parents sang and taught him what they could, at age 11, he left home to make a living for himself as a logger. He spent the next five years in lumber camps and sawmills and walked with Jesus throughout this rough environment. Between these jobs, he would attend school and study music. He was also active in ministry throughout Methodist revival services. At age 17, he took the final steps to attain his credentials and he became the schoolmaster at Hartsville, New York. With the encouragement of friends and mentors, he became a music teacher in Rome, Pennsylvania. A few years later, he was married to Lucy, the love of his life, and struck out as an itinerant music teacher from town to town. This changed when his wife's grandmother gave him money to attend a formal music academy in New York. In 1864, at age 26, they moved to Chicago and he became widely known as a teacher, a singer, and composer. For the next eight years, he was very well known nationally and financially successful. Life was going very well for him. Throughout this time, he developed a friendship with a great evangelist preacher, D.L. Moody, and his associate, Daniel Whittle. They challenged him to leave his business and work with them. After a number of years, Bliss decided to join Whittle at an evangelistic meeting. He sang one of his songs and numerous people felt the conviction of sin and surrendered their lives to Jesus. Despite his success financially, as well as an educator and songwriter, in humility he walked away from his business and began full-time work as an evangelist alongside Whittle and Moody. He traveled with them for the next two years, seeing many lives transformed for Jesus. In 1876, Bliss conducted a service with 800 inmates of a Michigan prison. He sang Man of Sorrows, one of his last hymns. As he sang this beautiful expression of Christ's humility and sacrifice, many of the prisoners openly wept and gave their lives to Jesus. No one could have known this would be his last public performance. After celebrating Christmas with his family in Pennsylvania, Bliss boarded a train to Chicago to sing at a New Year's service for Moody. It was snowing heavily when he came to that bridge in Ohio. After the bridge collapsed, the train fell and burst into flames. Bliss initially survived by being thrown from the train, but with his wife on board, Bliss, like Jesus, became obedient even to death to save his wife. He rushed back into the burning train, and both he and Lucy were consumed in the fire, and their bodies were never recovered. Found in his trunk, which somehow survived the crash and fire, was a manuscript bearing the lyrics of his last song, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Philip Bliss, both in life and death, 
was a humble man who consistently considered others before himself, Deal Moody said this of his friend, In my estimate, he was the most highly honored of God of any man of his time as a writer and singer of gospel songs, and with all his gifts, he was the most humble man I ever knew. I loved him as a brother. Welcome back to our message on hymns, and uh, we're going to look at something very interesting, maybe some things you're not aware of in reference to hymns. Uh, I'll show you something. I have a number of hymn books. I used to try to collect some of them. I have some real old ones, and I'm going to show you one particular hymn book I have, and one of the things that's interesting about hymn books, uh, we have one right here, and uh, one of the things that's very interesting about hymn books, when you have multiple hymn books, you find out that some are, have some songs that you like and some are missing some songs. Um, but when you have a particular hymn book that we use nowadays, of course at the very beginning it preferences the, the types of hymns that are in there. Uh, then it also has the authors that are in there. And of course it has the songs that are listed in there as well. And they're broken up into different categories. But one of the things that's very interesting when you have one uh, if you see here, generally what, what you have, uh, you'll have here, uh, the person who actually wrote the song, 
And then on the side here, you actually have the person who put the music to the song. And uh, quite often, it's uh, years later that it, that happened to come to be. So as I stated before, not always did you have a hymn and a song put together. But it's very interesting when you look at this particular hymn book. I'm going to show you something. And uh, so you look at the very front of it. It says Baptist Hymnal. And uh, it's kind of funny when you look at that. It says Baptist Hymnal. And the funny thing about it is most of these songs are not written by Baptists. <laughs> so, uh, it's, I think it's kind of comical. But uh, sometimes I remember I heard a preacher preaching. uh said, bless God, we should only sing songs out of the Baptist hymn book. And uh, I knew that that statement was very ignorant because most of the people, like I stated, are not Baptists who wrote it. Uh, there are a good number of Baptists who wrote songs. Uh, but I'll give you an example. Um, you have uh, John Newton, uh, who wrote the song Amazing Grace. If you're to take, what is the most amazing, uh, what most popular song that's ever been sung as far as a hymn uh, that's been translated to different languages? Uh, we would say Amazing Grace. And that was written by John Newton. Uh, he was a slave owner at one time, an uh, atheist type individual, and uh, ended up uh, realizing that he needed to get saved and uh, come to Christ as his personal savior and uh, got saved. And then he became an Anglican preacher. So the very most popular song uh, that we're aware of that was written in our hymn book is written by an Anglican preacher. So it's kind of funny that when you have a book that says Baptist Hymnal, when uh, a lot of the songs on there are not written by Baptists. But uh, we have an example of Charles Wesley. Uh, he wrote over uh, 8,000 hymns. Fanny Crosby, she wrote about 8,000 hymns. Uh, she was Methodist, became uh, Baptist later on. Um, but uh, Fanny Crosby served as a deaconess in her church, also as a lay preacher. Uh, imagine that, Fanny Crosby, blind, serving as a lay preacher in a Baptist church. And uh, sometimes we hear, uh, and this will cover this on the next uh, message in regards to uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sometimes I've heard the statement that, well, we don't sing those songs, I'm talking about certain spiritual songs, because we don't agree with those who wrote the songs. And uh, it's funny when you hear that because a lot of times when you look at the hymns, some of those same people who make those statements don't actually agree with a lot of the people who wrote the hymns <laughs> that they sing and covet to. Uh, again, these hymns, you had, uh, you had a lot of Greek hymns that were originally written, and, uh, but we don't sing any of those today. Um, you had some Latin hymns. When a lot of the world spoke Latin, uh, and we in our traditional churches uh, don't sing the Latin hymns, but we sing, as I stated before, hymns generally from the uh, 1700 period to roughly 18, early 1900s. And there are a few exceptions to some a little bit earlier. But uh, I'll give a, an example when it talks about, again, this is Baptist hymnal. I'll give you an example of uh, some of the people who wrote songs. Um, D.L. Moody. Uh, D.L. Moody was very well known, uh, an evangelist um, in Chicago. And uh, he was, if you ask what type of religion he belonged to, he was considered an evangelical Christian. Uh, he wasn't part of a denomination, or I guess his denomination would be considered evangelical Christian, conservative evangelical Christian. and um, But he was good friends with people like uh, Horatio Statterford, who wrote It Is Well With My Soul, uh, Philip Bliss. and uh, But amongst these group, you have uh, many Methodists who wrote songs. Uh, you have um, a Pho a Phoebe Knapp. Uh, she said uh, she wrote a, a song that's very popular. Uh, multiple songs are very popular, but she was considered a Methodist Episcopal. So a little bit of a combination of, uh, nowadays we have Methodists and we have Episcopal, uh, 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 different people are Episcopal, and but she belonged to the combination there. Uh, if you were to take, what is your most uh, popular, well-known song in the world when you think of a Christmas song? 
that when you play the music, uh, what song does it automatically trigger? Hey, I know what that song is. And if I was to say Silent Night, it's probably one of the most popular songs as far as Christmas that were ever written. And uh, you say, well, who wrote uh, Silent Night? It was actually an Australian, uh, Austrian man named Joseph Moore and, uh, in 1816. And uh, he was a Catholic priest who actually wrote that. So the most famous, uh, one of the most famous Christian uh, Christmas hymns, uh, Silent Night, which this song is sung in every religion, uh, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, we're all around the world. In Christian Dome, I guess you could reference it, uh, Silent Night, and that song was written by a Catholic priest and uh, named Joseph Moore, who the organ was not working, and uh, so he went out that evening and right before uh, midnight mass, went out to write this song, uh, got connected with a friend that played the, the guitar, and they put and they practiced with the choir just before midnight, and Joseph Moore, this priest, in 1816, put together this song that we sing all over the world called Silent Night. So what's the point I'm trying to share with you in our hymnal? This is Baptist hymnal. And our Baptist hymnal is not really Baptist. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of a bunch of different uh, groups who wrote, Catholic, Methodist, Evangelical, uh, Anglican, and yes, there's some. There's a Baptist. There's a sprinkle of them there as well. So, before we claim these to be all our hymns, uh, we need to look at it from a historical perspective. And uh, with some videos we have coming up, uh, we'll have, be sharing that uh, some more background of different hymns. And uh, so, and I hope you enjoy the music coming up. More hymn history coming up. God bless. We want to thank those who give to our ministry. If you go on our website at the very bottom, we have a place to donate there. Helps us to continue the ministry of preaching the gospel, getting out food, and uh, reaching people as many as we can. And we thank you for doing that. We know the Lord always provides. So thank you very much for giving, and uh, God bless you.
Because of God's grace, each of us can experience victory in Jesus no matter what circumstances or challenges face us along the way. This was certainly the testimony of Eugene Bartlett in the early 1900s. Eugene Monroe Bartlett Sr. is considered to be one of the founding fathers of Southern gospel music. He penned many favorite songs for singing conventions of the day, such as, Everybody Will Be Happy Over There. Just a little while and he will remember me. In 1939 though, at age 53, he suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed, making it extremely difficult for him to walk or even to speak. The stroke effectively ended his singing and teaching ministry. But it was during these dark days that Mr. Bartlett reminisced about the night he was saved, which prompted him to write the following lyrics. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. But as he began to pen another verse, he realized that God was dealing with his heart during this season of suffering. He then wrote, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. In Mr. Bartlett's affliction, there was discouragement, depression, and even despair. But he didn't ask for healing of his body, no. Instead, like King David of old, he prayed, renew a right spirit within me. Because he was no longer able to fulfill his teaching commitments, his older son, Gene Jr., took his place in the singing schools that were already scheduled. The first of these events was booked in the oil town of Laird Hill in East Texas. Gene decided to ask a very well-known evangelist to speak the final night of the school. The evangelist did preach, but not one person went forward with the invitation. Gene was very disheartened, of course, but then he felt the Lord urging him to sing a new song that had recently been written by his father. Soon the words of victory in Jesus filled the auditorium and people began to move. They moved forward toward the front to accept Christ as Savior. When the service was finally ended, some 50 people had made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Eugene Monroe Bartlett Sr. died just two years after his stroke on January 25, 1941, at the age of 55. During his lifetime, he would never realize the impact his music and ministry would have on the generations of believers that would follow. One of the reasons that we believe in the importance of timeless hymns of the faith is because they help to tie generations together. Let's enjoy this unique opportunity to sing his very special song, Victory in Jesus. John Newton was born in London, July 24, 1725, the son of the commander of a merchant ship which sailed the Mediterranean. John had a devout Christian mother that taught him the Bible at an early age. Then when John was only seven, she became seriously ill and died. However, she had trained her son well in the scriptures and taught him the hymns of the church. She would often say to her young son, I am praying that someday you will become a minister of the Word of God. At age 11, John went to sea with his father. When his father retired, John continued to work as a common seaman, but left to his own devices, Newton fell deep into sin. Soon he was forced into the naval service. He became a midshipman, but when he attempted to desert, he was tied to the grating, flogged a dozen lashes, and was reduced to the rank of a common seaman. Following the disgrace and humiliation, Newton contemplated suicide. Eventually he recovered and later transferred to the slave ship Pegasus, carrying goods to Africa and trading them for slaves. Newton proved to be a continual problem for the crew of Pegasus. They left him in Africa, where he was given to an African duchess. He was abused and mistreated along with her other slaves. 
It was this period that Newton later remembered as a time so bad he was dependent on the slaves for food. Early in 1748, he was rescued by a sea captain who had been asked by Newton's father to search for him. However, knowing only a life at sea, Newton soon made his way back onto another trade ship. But he was so given to wickedness that he was soon despised by his own crew. At one point in drunken rage, he fell overboard into the sea. His crew's only attempt at rescue was to hurl a whaling harpoon at him. Striking him in the thigh, they hauled him on board like a speared fish. From that day till his death, Newton walked with a limp. On a homeward voyage at age 22, Newton awoke to a violent storm. His room began to flood with seawater and he rushed towards the deck. On his way, the captain stopped him and sent him to get a knife. The man who took his place on the deck was instantly washed overboard to his death. Newton was assigned to the pumps in an effort to keep the boat from sinking. He worked the pumps and then would take his shift at the helm. While he was attempting to steer the ship through the violent storm, he experienced what he was to refer to later as his great deliverance. One witness recorded, during the height of the storm, someone uttered an oath using the name of God. The sound of that holy name, even in an oath, struck home. Newton's thoughts turned to his godly mother who had so carefully taught him about God and God's word. As Newton continued to do his part in steadying and steering the ship, he prayed, O oh God, if thou wilt get me safely ashore, I will serve thee forever. He recorded in his journal that when all seemed lost and the ship would surely sink, he cried out, Lord, have mercy upon us. Later, when the storm abated, he reflected on what he had said and began to believe that God had saved him from the storm. For the rest of his life, he observed the anniversary of that very day as the day of his conversion, a day of humiliation in which he subjected his will to God's. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He continued in the slave trade for a time after his conversion. However, he saw to it that the slaves under his care were treated humanely. It was not until later in life that he would strongly oppose the slave trade. In 1750, he married Mary Catlett, with whom he had been in love for many years. By 1755, he had given up seafaring forever. During his days as a sailor, he had begun to educate himself, teaching himself Latin, among other subjects. Soon he came to know George Whitfield, evangelistic preacher and pastor. During this period, Newton also met and came to admire John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement. Newton's self-education continued and he learned Greek and Hebrew. Newton decided to become a minister and applied for ordination. At first, his request was refused, but Newton persisted in his goal and was finally ordained. His church became so crowded during services that it had to be enlarged. In 1767, the poet William Cooper and Newton became friends. Cooper helped Newton with his religious services. They held not only a regular weekly church service, but also began a series of weekly prayer meetings for which their goal was to write a new hymn for each one. Newton wrote 280 hymns, the most well-known of them being Amazing Grace. There are two occasions upon which it is believed Newton wrote this hymn. Some believe he wrote it on the occasion of his beloved wife's funeral, while others believe it was written as a testimony of the great change God brought upon his life. In either case, what a powerful and beautiful monument to the glorious grace of God. After Mary's death in 1790, he published letters to a wife in which he expressed his grief and love. Plagued by ill health and failing eyesight, Newton died on December 21st, 1807. The epitaph on John Newton's gravestone says, John Newton, clerk or preacher, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the gospel which he had long labored to destroy. John Newton was instrumental in encouraging his friend and ally, William Wilberforce, to fight for the abolition of slavery in Parliament. Wilberforce was the major force in bringing about the end of the slave trade in Britain. Encouraged by Newton, Wilberforce fought for the abolition of the slave trade for almost 46 years facing mountains of opposition. Through it all, he faced this conflict with the same spirit that had led Newton. John Newton's life was filled with hurdles, strife, and adversity.
But all of this only served to embolden Newton's faith and to cause him to rely more and more on the grace he had first received in the middle of a violent storm at sea, so that one day he could write the words to a hymn that would touch the lives of countless people around the world. Among Newton's contributions, which are still loved and sung today, are how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, and glorious things of thee are spoken, as well as amazing grace. Indeed, John Newton's life is the story of amazing grace. Thank you for joining us on our last segment on Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, and we'll be concluding, concluding this portion of hymns. And uh, there's a huge history when it comes to hymns. I stated before how I opened up a Baptist hymn book and a lot of the songs in there are not written by Baptists. But uh, hymns do go back a good ways, but we have to t keep in consideration that the hymns that we sing now are European hymns uh, quite often. Uh, in different countries, they have different music. Uh, if we travel to of the Middle East, uh, in Christendom, they have different music. In Africa, uh, Asia, uh, all across the world, they're not necessarily singing the same hymns, the same music that we have. So we can't limit ourselves to just what we read out of a hymn book and say, hey, these are the ones that we're supposed to sing and nothing else. Because um, as I stated before, according to the Word of God, we have no idea the hymns that uh, Jesus Christ sung with his disciples. We have no idea the hymns that uh, Paul the Apostle uh, mentions about singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Because many of the songs, I stated before, that we sing are based on 200 years uh, within the European society. There's a lot of um, uh, Greek songs that came out. We know they're in a Christian uh, period and also... Uh, um, uh, numerous uh, the German hymns that came out and then after the German hymns and then uh, after that then we had more songs uh, from English speakers that started spreading from England uh, to United States and then uh, finally we see that but uh, for example some of the songs we see uh, one is called Thomas Ken uh, he wrote a song in 1674 uh, called praise God from all heaven blessings flow and that's a song you quite often find in your hymn book. And uh, his particular religious perspective, he was considered an English congregational uh, person. And uh, he was an Anglican, uh, actually he was an Anglican bishop. Uh, very similar to what John Newton was. And uh, But we see he wrote, wrote this hymn in 1674. Also, another famous hymn writer we see is Isaac Watts. And Isaac Watts wrote about 750 hymns. And he was an English congregationist as far as uh, his belief. And he wrote songs, for example, Joy to the World, written by Isaac, Isaac Watts. Alas, did my Savior uh, die or bleed? Uh, that's actually written by Isaac Watts in 1719. And as we continue on, we see Charles Wesley, and uh, his brother was also uh, influential and uh, would put together uh, poems and music, and uh, he wrote over 8,000 hymns, and uh, he was a Methodist minister, and uh, he wrote songs like Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, and that was uh, written in 1739. And then we see also some another person who's very interesting, uh, Fanny Crosby. Uh, she was uh, my favorite hymn writer, wrote about 8,000 hymns, and uh, she was um, blind from the age of six weeks of age when uh, some honey mustard was placed on her eye by a doctor. The regular doctor was not in town, and uh, so the acting doctor, and uh, which really wasn't a doctor, uh, she developed some type of runny eyes, and he placed some type of uh, mustard on her eyes and caused her to go blind. And that's Fanny Crosby, and um, she also, her father passed away that same year uh, that she was uh, born. And uh, so she grew up with her mother and also with her um, uh, f um, grandmother and learned huge portions of the Word of God. But later on in life became, uh, uh, realized of her sinful condition and uh, received Christ as her Savior. 
And she'd go on to write uh, many hymns, one being called Blessed Assurance. Uh, that's my favorite hymn of all time. Uh, we see another interesting uh, writer, uh, and uh, his name is William Cowper. And William Cowper wrote the song, There is a Fountain. We all know that song, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood, Drawn from Emmanuel's Veins. Uh, William Cowper was noted to be one of the most famous poets at his time. Uh, he was uh, somebody even back in the uh, mid to late 1700s who was uh, very much against slavery and was actually asked to write uh, po poems in reference to uh, the anti-slavery movement. And actually, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, will later on quote one of his uh, poems that he wrote in reference to uh, a, a slave's poem, in essence, and he wrote multiple poems. We have to keep in consideration that a lot of these writers, as they pinned down their hymns and published them, like I stated, uh, Charles Wesley wrote about 8,000 hymns, Fannie Mae Crosby wrote about 8,000 hymns. A lot of these songs, we have no idea what they are, uh, we don't have them listed, uh, but there's just a handful of those would go on and became, became popular songs, uh, ones that we sing in our churches. So that's something to keep in consideration. Uh, certain songs may not have stuck uh, or they may not have gravitated to certain churches, but that's something to keep in consideration. Uh, that Many, many hymns have been written, but there's only a handful actually uh, that we continue to sing today. And the William Cooper, uh, actually, he was uh, in an, uh, put into a, considered insane, actually. Uh, and he was in a hospital, but developed uh, writing hymns uh, as his source, and it was something to encourage him. And that ended up helping him to go on and uh, write many, many hymns and his poems that he would write. And uh, so these are people who dealt with different issues, uh, uh, wasn't always easy for them. Uh, one of the writers, we see a, a song called um, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Uh, his whole family was put to death, and this was in uh, India. And uh, we're going to play that video and just uh, and today, and you'll see the story of that writer who uh, decided, who wrote the song I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And his wife was put, his children were put to death, his wife was put to death. And then finally, he was put to death. And later on, the chief who consented and actually required that they would die uh, would later on become a Christian, and uh, Christianity spread throughout that community in India. And uh, we'll be playing that in just momentarily. And lastly, uh, Edward uh, Baranot, uh, he wrote the song, uh, All Hell the Power of Jesus' Name in 1750. And uh, he, he was, um, uh, grew up in a devout uh, home, and his parents, his father was a, uh, I believe was an Anglican priest. And uh, so we see the different individuals who wrote here who had different uh, things that they went through. Uh, as I stated, many of these songs were not published, but these songs that we have in our hymn books are, in essence, European songs that we sing in our churches quite often in European churches. And uh, if you travel around the world, you'll see uh, that maybe there's some that's been translated. And maybe you can go to Africa and hear certain songs that, that are written, for example, that are popular. Amazing Grace and so on that are translated to different countries. Uh, but as we travel around the world in the Christian uh, faith, we see that quite often people would write hymns or music in their own country. And those songs they still sing today. And uh, so the hymns that we have are not the ones that Christ sung or the disciples, the ones that were written in the last few hundred years, and uh, but some, has some great stories behind them. And uh, that's why the Bible says to sing to yourself psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I invite you to join us next week as we'll be looking at uh, spiritual songs, and that covers a gamut of songs. But I uh, hope you enjoy the next few stories uh, we'll be sharing on uh, the next few videos coming up now in reference to hymns. Thank you for joining us this week. God bless and have a wonderful night, day. God bless. Bye-bye.
This hymn is a tremendous hymn as far as its uh, explanation of who God is. Obviously, the, the message is, is there. Uh, a true friend. Um, all our needs and sorrows bear. We bring it to, to the Lord in prayer. Uh, he cares. He sustains. I don't know about you, but how many times we fail to really realize what a friend we do have in the Lord. In the spring of 1844, the hills of Ireland were green. Clouds drifted across painted skies. And for a young Irishman, the future was filled with hope and promise. Joseph Scriven had completed his university education and returned to his home outside of Dublin. He was engaged to his childhood love and soon planned to take her hand in marriage. On the day before their wedding, Scriven's fiance rode out to meet him along the banks of the River Bon. In a terrifying instant, her horse was startled and she was thrown headfirst into the rushing waters. Knocked unconscious by the fall, she drowned moments before Scriven arrived. And they were taking the body out of the water and he was close enough to look and he looked into the face of the girl that he was supposed to marry the next day. As he said later, he said, the bottom of my world seemed to just disappear. And he said, no, wherever I looked after that in Ireland, I always was reminded of the wonderful day I had looked forward to that never had occurred. Emotionally shattered by the death of his love, Joseph Scriven turned to God for consolation and guidance. He decided to leave Ireland, and in 1845, he arrived in Ontario, Canada, where he would spend the rest of his life. Scriven settled near the town of Port Hope, on the shores of Lake Ontario. There he committed himself to the ideals of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, devoting his life to helping others in need. Each day he walked these roads assisting widows, the sick and the poor. It was said that he never once denied a request for help and that his greatest desire was to reflect the love of God through his life. For nearly 40 years, Joseph Scriven was a living light of charity and faith in this small Canadian town. And for his acts of kindness, he came to be known as the Good Samaritan of Port Hope. So he devoted his life to love and good deeds for the people of his community there. And they saw him walking down the street carrying a sawhorse and a saw. And someone in the community said, well, there's Joseph Scriven. Uh, he's willing to saw wood for anyone. And this particular individual said, boy, I'd like to hire him to do it for me. I'd, I'd love to find a sober young man to cut wood for me and this individual responded well you won't get Joseph Scriven because he only helps the people who cannot pay or have no resources for which to uh, reimburse you so he really did want to help people out of the goodness of his heart because of God's grace
Joseph Scriven spent many years tutoring the children of Robert Pengelly, a retired British sea captain. It was in this house that he met and fell in love with Pengelly's niece, Eliza Roche. They were to be married in the spring of 1854. Yet only weeks before their wedding, tragedy struck Striven's life for a second time. Eliza Roche became ill with pneumonia. Despite Joseph's vigilant care, she died at the age of 23. Once again, Scriven was heartbroken by the loss of a woman he loved. And once again, he found strength by turning to a God he looked upon as his closest friend. The following year, he wrote a poem to his mother in Ireland. His words describe this extraordinary friendship that had given him purpose and hope in the face of devastating pain. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. In simple yet eloquent language, Joseph Scriven, a man well acquainted with sorrow and loneliness, had defined for the world the essence of a right relationship with God. He saw his creator not as an impersonal force to be feared, but as a loving father and friend whose greatest desire is to carry our burdens and ease our pain. For the rest of his life, Scriven would continue to demonstrate his faith throughout Port Hope. And today, more than a century after his death, his profound insights into the true character of God still resound through the legacy of a timeless hymn. Joseph Scriven's poem was first published anonymously. Nearly a decade passed before Scriven revealed to a neighbor and to the rest of the world that he and the Lord had written it together. Today, what a friend we have in Jesus stands among the most beloved hymns ever penned. And outside of Port Hope, a monument commemorates the life and work of a humble, yet remarkable man who trusted God with the deepest burdens of his life and walked with him as his friend.